Welcome. Um, in our last uh, video, we kind of looked at microcontrollers from a very uh, high-level view. Um, and in this set of videos, uh, we're going to break it up into two. We're going to kind of focus in a little bit more on uh, microcontrollers. So um, in these videos, we're not going to look at any particular microcontroller. We're going to kind of look at kind of like a generic device, you know, that you might find from any vendor just to kind of get a feel for what's inside and kind of how they work. Uh, we're not going to look at any particular company or, or, or variant. Um, I just want you to kind of get a feel for, you know, what, what's inside a device and, you know, what to expect. Um, so throughout the video, uh, you're going to hear me use the word microcontroller, but the other acronym you may hear me say is MCU. stands for microcontroller unit. Um, very common in the industry uh, to see MCU. So I just wanted to prepare you for that. Now the first part of the microcontroller we're going to look at um, and discuss is the central processing unit, um, also known as the core. So the core is the piece of the puzzle that makes everything work. Um, it's responsible for, for executing code um, and is essentially the engine, you know, of the microcontroller. Um, it does everything. So uh, fundamentally, it's, it's, its job is to get instructions and execute them. Um, and instruction sets are generally pretty simple. Uh, we it, It'll move data, it can add, multiply, subtract, and do, do comparisons. Um, we often select a microcontroller um, based upon the CPU and the core, and kind of one of the uh, parameters we look at is the native data size. What that means is how big of a number binary number in bits, you know, does that processor, uh, how much can it uh, 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 compute at one time? You know, can it add 32-bit numbers at a time, 16-bit, 8-bit, 64-bit? Uh, what's its register size? Uh, often the native data size is the, the register size, but not always. Um, it's internal register size, um, but it usually reflects uh, you know, what its native data type is, you know, and what's kind of the biggest number it can process at any one time. The kind of second parameter that engineers tend to look at is the core clock speed. The CPU core is a synchronous, you know, a, a, a piece of synchronous logic. It needs a clock. Um, and in microcontrollers, we can have everything from a low power, 1 megahertz, 10 megahertz, um, and get really fast to 100 megahertz and beyond. Now, you typically don't see microcontrollers that are in the gigahertz realm. That's that's a different application space for, say, application processors, say, in your phone, the high-end ARM chips, or a desktop microprocessor. Uh, microcontrollers tend to be in the several hundred megahertz, the high-end, uh, down to a few megahertz. That's where you kind of see the microcontroller space. So the next piece we, we want to look at is non-volatile memory, meaning memory that after power goes away, it, it holds its state. Um, and why do we need that? Well, non-volatile memory is what stores executable code. Um, you know, we can't have, a, you know, uh, the primary memory source just going away after, after power up. It has to boot up and do something. Um, so it's going to store constants, um, things that are, you know, maybe numbers in your code that always remain the same. For example, strings and text. Um, and it's also your primary source of instructions after boot. Um, now, that's not saying there aren't other ways to boot a microprocessor or other sources, but generally when you boot up, you need some, uh, some source of instructions. And most often, um, more often than not, uh, the CPU um, or the core will look to its flash memory uh, for, for its boot up source. Um, often when you uh, look at microcontroller specs, they're sized in 8 bits and bytes but they're internally organized to this native 
uh, type size of the CPU. So for example, you might see a device that has 128 kilobytes of flash, but internal, um, internal to that chip, uh, more often than not, it's organized as 32 bits or 16 bits or whatever that native uh, type size is. In this case, if it's a 32-bit processor, it's probably uh, 32 kilowords if there's 120 kilobytes. The reason we do that, or a system designer will do that, is when a CPU is grabbing instructions, it doesn't want to have to grab uh, uh, you know, a lot of little pieces. It wants to grab a big chunk of data. So the other piece we see in a microcontroller, you know, is random access memory or volatile memory. So this is memory that can kind of, uh, when you remove power, it goes away. Um, so it's used to store variables, uh, any sort of runtime data, um, anything that may change throughout the course of the execution of your program. So uh, if you're sampling a sensor data and you want to keep a record of that to do uh, uh, averaging, um, that's a good example. Um, maybe you have uh, uh, data coming in over a serial port or some sort of communications bus. You need to store that. Um, those are good examples of runtime data, um, intermediate computations, um, so on and so forth. Um, RAM, it can store executable code depending on the architecture um, of your system. Uh, some systems like to completely separate the executable code from, you know, its, its data uh, so that they can be accessed at the same time. Um, but some systems do not. Some, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You can store executable code in RAM. Uh, the important thing to keep in mind is that RAM doesn't have anything in it after boot. You need a bootloader to kind of dump data from some source, say flash memory or something, say from the outside world into that RAM before you can execute. So like flash, when you, know, when you go to a website to look at a, a microcontroller, it's sized in bytes, eight bits at a time, but it's often organized you know, almost always to the native type size of the CPU for the same reason the flash is, is that when the CPU wants to access memory, uh, it's more efficient to do it with uh, bigger data types. So another important piece of logic that is on virtually in all microprocessors is some sort of debug logic. What debug logic does it gives us neat features, you know, that allows us to, say, halt the CPU. Um, it can literally look at the program counter and compare it to a value and say, just stop. You know, it can access, you know, uh, you know, internal stuff from, you know, RAM and Flash. So that if you want to inspect variables as the program is running, uh, a, a debugger can do that. So... The debug unit, I have it kind of drawn here attached to the core. Depending on the architecture, the debug unit may be integrated with a core. It may be a separate peripheral. Um, it, it really depends. Um, more and more microcontrollers, uh, to give fancier features, they're tightly integrated. Now, the debug logic often has, I shouldn't say often, almost always has, um, some sort of interface available on the pins of the device. Meaning you've got to tell this debug logic to do something, so you need pins on the device that you can kind of command the debug logic. So the way you do that is you have to connect to a PC via some sort of adapter tool. So Freescale has this, you know, open source JTAG um, third party. You can buy something uh, called the JLink from Seeger. Uh, Peony Micro makes adapters for uh, Freescale devices, um, so on and so forth. But what you do is you find your chip you like, um, you look at its debugging capabilities, and then look at what debuggers are available to you. Now, the debug interface, these pins, you know, that get tied into the uh, debug logic, they may be some sort of, there are standard interfaces. Uh, for example, JTAG is an IEEE standard, or maybe something proprietary, like Freescale for a lot of controllers use something called BDM. Um, for example, Microchip PIC, they have their own ICD. Uh, ARM has its own JTAG interface. 
Um, JTAG is certainly the most popular, but it's not the only one. Because JTAG uh, uses up more pins than, say, BDM or ICD. Um, but it is very popular. So another key part of a microcontroller is the system bus. Now we need a way for the CPU to talk to the flash memory uh, into the RAM. We need some sort of pathway. So the idea here is that if the CPU wants to uh, grab data from the flash memory, you know, it makes some sort of request over the bus and then can, you know, read the data over the bus, you know, or maybe it wants to read from RAM. So we need a pathway for that to, for that to happen. So all this pathway is, is a bunch of electrical signals, address, data, and control that facilitate uh, the movement of the data. Now it should be uh, noted that in some architectures, there may be multiple buses or some sort of bus matrix, some sort of switch. Um, the idea there is that maybe you want more than one transaction to happen simultaneously on that bus. For example, maybe you want to get instruction data while you're grabbing data or writing to memory. Um, this is completely architecture dependent. Um, different microprocessors will have different bus structures. But that's something you open up the reference manual data sheet um, you're likely to find at the beginning. So. A bus will have address, data, and control signals. Um, the address bus is used to kind of provide what we'll call like a mailbox or mailboxes, um, you know, and unique IDs to the different pe uh, peripherals on the bus. So the size of the address bus kind of determines how many different things can coexist. If you have a small address bus, you can't have that many different things. It's like, imagine a town of 10,000 people, but five mailboxes. It, it just doesn't work. You need at least one mailbox for um, for every you know house. And in some cases, some buildings might have 100 mailboxes. You might have a corporate office building where you need to have a lot of different places for data to go. Um, the data bus is where the actual data moves, and the larger the data bus, you know, the more data can be moved in one control cycle. And this is this is a really important, um, you know, uh, design feature of a bus in a system is that you want to optimize the bus, you know, to the, the CPU and core because you don't want the core having to do multiple accesses over that bus. Um, for simple operations, because that'll just slow everything down. For example, if you had a 32-bit core in an 8-bit bus, um, to grab a 32-bit number, it has to do four transactions, four clock cycles, um, and that just slows the system down. So, um, this is the conclusion of the first half of kind of looking at what's inside of, you know, a, a microcontroller. You know, in part two, we're going to take a look at kind of the other stuff you're going to see, um, what I'm going to call the good stuff, you know, and how do we pick a microcontroller. Um, so I hope to see you soon.